Hi, everybody. Chuck here on Saturday with uh, an important show to uh, curate here on the Select Saturday. It was an important episode, uh, a pretty depressing one, though, because it's about the history of uh, landmines. And it's from April 10th, 2018. Why landmines are the deadliest legacy of war. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and there's Jerry Rowland back together again at last, just like last week. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> what are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about, Willis. What you talking about? Um, oh, that was a pretty good one. Subtle. Understated. <laughs> um, so, Chuck, how are you feeling today? Mm, I'm kind of tired of this weather. Yeah, it's pretty nasty, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's almost April in Atlanta, and it's still cold at night. It's um, And during the day, for that yeah, matter. It, it usually, like, the, the way that Atlanta is, for those who don't know, it'll be cold, 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 like really cold, down in the freezing. Sometimes it'll snow, and then it'll start to warm up. And then at the end of February, boom. One more snow out of nowhere, and then spring. That's not how it's going this time. No. No. It, it's been, like, real gloomy and dismal, huh? Yeah, I got the sads. It, it's okay. It'll it'll clear up soon enough. Easter's on its way. No. Peter Rabbit's <laughs> going to bring us some sunshine in springtime. Good. And poison eggs. Poison eggs? Is, <laughs> no, you're, you're thinking of Halloween candy. Oh, right. So, um, today, Chuck, we're not talking about Halloween or Easter or even the weather. We're talking about something um, that has become kind of a f- international, global issue, rightfully so, in like the best way possible. Uh, because in this case, the international community, the global community has kind of come together to try to alleviate a, a really overlooked problem, literally and figuratively overlooked mm-hmm. problem, um, landmines. Yeah, and has been, this isn't like a brand new effort. No. But uh, it's a little daunting, to say the least, and depressing. It is. Um, there's something like, I saw, there's all these really, like you say, depressing statistics all over the place when you look into landmines. Fortunately, although they are daunting, they're not so daunting that people are just like, forget it, we're not even going to do this. Right. But I saw something like uh, it would take 1,100 years oh, at the current pace of progress to remove all the landmines on Earth right now that are buried on Earth if not another single one is laid. Yeah. Well, part of the problem, though, was the number they're laying landmines 25 times faster yes. than we're gathering up old landmines? Yes. Yeah, that's the issue. Yeah, it's something one of like many. I saw between 2.5 million and 5 million landmines are laid Every year, new ones. And more than 100 million in over 70 countries around the world. Yeah, uh, that's a lot. In places where there's no war or conflict going on any longer. That's Mm -hmm. the big problem with landmines. Well, there's a couple problems. One, they're indiscriminate. They don't don't recognize whether you're a civilian or a, 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 a soldier. Yeah. They stick around long after the conflict is is over, and they still manage to to kill and maim thousands of people every year around the world. It, which, and apparently, it's on an upswing thanks to um, the conflicts in Yemen and Syria, yeah. and and some of the work of ISIS as well. Just so depressing. It really is. There's like no, there's nothing that really more <clears throat> that like kind of embodies like just the mute killing, maiming aspect of war than a landmine. It's just a dumb lump of explosive that you step on and it blows you up. You know what I mean? Yeah, and especially the the years later effect, which is maybe there hasn't been war for two decades mm-hmm. and a little kid can still come along and say, oh, what's this thing? And then they don't have legs. Yeah, and the kid's thing is is real. So apparently landmines kill, disproportionately kill civilians way more than soldiers because of their ability to be left over after a war. And the most recent statistics from 2016, the majority of the civilians killed were children. Yeah. 
I was I was actually I was talking to Yumi about it. She uh, grew up on Okinawa, and there's a lot of World War II unexploded ordnance around there. Mm-hmm. And she was telling me that they used to watch like educational films saying like if you see something metal in the woods, stay away, go tell an adult. Yeah, I'm that sure. was like the the movies they were they were taught. You know? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, when you're raised in an area where, and we're talking about landmines specifically, but uh, in a lot of cases they're just unexploded bombs and things like that too. Yeah, I I know, like, they find something like 100 tons of it in Belgium alone every year. Yeah. Most of it from World War I still. Wow. So, or, but we are talking specifically about landmines, which seem to kind of bear the focus of the international efforts to to get rid of them, because they are probably the biggest problem of unexploded ordnance today. Yeah. Uh, well, should we go back in time here and talk about the history? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, this one was interesting because I don't think a lot of people when they hear about landmines know that they started in, like, legit started during the American Civil War. No, I I thought World War II at the earliest. Yeah, so uh, in the American Civil War, they were called uh, torpedoes or subterra shells. (laughs) There was a man, a North Carolinian named Gabriel Rains, Mm -hmm. who initially fought for the Union but then said, wait a minute, I'm from North Carolina. I'm not actually sure how that switch happened. He's like, North Carolina's with the <laughs> South? Ay, ay, ay. Uh, but he was the first person to um, sort of play around with these and eventually get a patent called the Reigns Patent mm-hmm. on what essentially was a very sort of early, crude, but effective landmine. Yeah, and so this is at a time when, like, pitched battles are still the norm. Sure. Where, like, your your infantry meets my infantry in a field, and, like, you do a bunch of shooting, and then we do a bunch of shooting, and then there's advancement and retreats and cannons and stuff like that. <laughs> like, is people, it our turn to shoot or their turn? I forgot. I mean, pretty much, <laughs> right? And there's people, like, picnicking, watching the battle. Like, that's how... That's how staged they were. Yeah. And and the Confederacy didn't necessarily play by those rules. They did in many battles, for sure. But they also definitely had a, 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 a guerrilla facet to them as well. And this definitely screams guerrilla warfare because the, the Union Army was taken totally off guard by the early um, landmines that they encountered. Yeah, and it was not something that was uh, readily accepted into warfare the the generals were um well everyone was scared first of all once they they got wind of what these things were they were all of a sudden like what like i can like we're literally just walking through the woods and now we can just die right and with no and, enemy nearby and apparently uh gabriel rains himself was one of the first to lay a bunch of these from the road to richmond after a de- the defeat of a battle and that's when they first uh, the union army first encountered these things well yeah so not only were they scared but then the the you know the the hierarchy the generals were pretty ticked off they were like this is you know one of the quotes is the rebels have been guilty of the most murderous and barbarous conduct so they were not welcomed into warfare they thought it was sort of a cheap trick and a dirty a dirty rotten thing to do yeah and like you said, it scared the troops. It, it upset the generals. And these were not just like landmines like we think of them now. They were like booby-trapped. Like they put them in flower sacks. And when you reached into a, sa- a flower sack, boom, that blew up. Yeah. They put them around. Like if the if the Confederates abandoned like a, an outpost, they would put them around the well, around the water, like places they knew the Union troops were going to go. And you could either set them off by stepping on them like a modern landmine, or they would attach things like tools to them with like a string. So you would bend down and pick up the tool and and set off this landmine that was buried nearby. Um, And at first, the Confederates, too, some of the Confederate higher-ups were like, I don't know if this is okay. Even even in a a civil war, and we're, you know, the Confederacy, we're we're in some ways a a guerrilla army. I'm not sure we should be using these. And then finally, after a while, they're like, okay, we, we kind of need every tool we can get in the toolbox. And they, they acquiesced and started using them. And they spread them all over the South, apparently. Yeah, and they don't have any uh, figures on the soldiers that were killed. But they do know that uh, total between uh, the Union and the Confederates, 35, well, actually, that's not true. 35 Union ships went down. One Confederate ship went down. Which I'm taking was an accident. Mm, I don't know. I don't Maybe. Either. Yeah. 
But remarkably, it says uh, here in this article you sent that they found them. They were still finding them in the 1960s in Alabama. Yeah, which makes you wonder. I wonder, like, uh, how many are there still out there, like in, in around Atlanta? You know, I don't know. I mean, surely <clears throat> none, right? Well, you would hope also that after this time, the the explosives would have decayed enough after being exposed to the weather for this long. One of the articles that we used said that the um, that landmines, modern landmines, have a, a, a useful life of over fifty years. Surely, by now, yeah. whatever they had attached to the the Confederate landmines are no longer useful, even if you did find them in the woods. I would think so. Which is not to say you should do like a belly flop on it to no. test it out. <laughs> if you find something that even vaguely resembles a landmine yeah. in the woods of the southeastern United States, run and tell somebody. Yeah, that is the the worst way to test out whether or not a landmine is still capable of working. Agreed. Is the belly flop method. Yeah. So the uh, the Civil War is where they got their start. And and they came into use pretty quickly after they were invented, uh, but it was World War One and then really World War Two, where they they really came into focus. And our article from How Stuff Works um, says that the the landmines for World War One and Two were invented to prevent people from picking up the landmines that were originally invented to blow up tanks. Yeah, I mean there were certain. They realized that there were a few uses. They could either uh, lay a minefield to keep a, a, a group of troops and or tanks from going to a certain place. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes it was to reroute a, a group of people and tanks to a different area because they're like, oh, well, we know that's a minefield, so we got to go this way, right. which might play right into the plans of the opposition. Uh, and then sometimes it's just to slow slow everybody down until they can get reinforcements. Right. So, I mean, there is a use for this besides just blowing somebody up. There's a larger strategic use for them, sure. which I hadn't really thought about. I always thought it was just, you know, a nasty way of blowing somebody up by yeah. chance, you know. But it really does send a message, too, which is don't keep going straight. Right. You're going to have to go one way or another yeah. because obviously this place is mined. And and really, there's only one way to find out whether a place is mined, too, especially during warfare. Like, it's not like the, the enemy posts a sign that says, we've mined this field, suckers. Yeah. Like, you find out because one of them goes off either on a tank or one of your soldiers, you know? Well, yeah, and if one of them goes off, it, it's there. I don't think they were using, like, random rogue landmines. It was more likely a minefield. Right. So um, World War II is where they really kind of came into play. One of the things I saw is that one of, so I guess by the numbers, the most mined place in the world as far as countries go is Egypt. Oh, really? I was like, what? I mean, by a long shot. Egypt has something like, um, I think, 230 million, no, sorry, 23 million mines wow. unexploded around Egypt. Egypt's not that big, right? Holy cow. I think they have like 60 per square kilometer, square mile, something like that. So they've got 23 million mines. And I was like, why Egypt? And it was the Nazis during the, the North African theater fighting uh-huh. in World War II. The Nazis mined all over around there. But apparently Egypt got the brunt of it. And there's still 23 million unexploded mines, they estimate, in Egypt from World War II. Should we take a break? Yeah, let's. All right. We'll take a break and we'll come back and we'll talk about the two main types of landmines uh, that we're going to cover today. Right after this. All right. So, uh, for the purposes of this and you know, there are more than 350 types of, of mines, so that would be exhaustive to go through all those. But uh, the way our article breaks it down, which makes sense to me, are in the two main groups, which are anti-personnel mines and anti-tank mines. Mm-hmm. Um, they both do about the same thing, which is explode after pressure is put on them. But in the cases of a tank, of course, they're going to be bigger with more boom and require more weight uh, in order to make it go boom. Right. More pressure. Yeah. So the um, 
the the anti anti personnel mines those are much lighter much smaller much cheaper and i think found in much greater abundance around the world for sure um there's there's one that this article covers called the uh, m14 blast mine and we should say there's actually a few different types of mines especially as far as anti personnel mines go right yeah so um there's this the the standard blast mine which is you step on it it goes boom um and bad things happen to you as a result. There's the bounding mind or bouncing mind. Um, basically, it means the same thing where you step on the mind, uh, a fuse is lit that that ignites a propeller charge, which shoots the mine upward from under under the ground, just barely covered over by the ground, up to about Chester head height, which then the mine explodes. Yeah. So it's designed to do even worse damage. Yeah, those are called uh, bouncing beddies or uh, German S mines, um, either for spring or, or shrapnel. And those, mm-hmm. I think I've seen those in movies before. Uh, that stuff is just nuts, man. You step on something and all of a sudden it it bounces up in the air to about your chest. And makes a, a horrible whizzing sound too, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I mean, talk about uh, like just sheer intimidation factor too. Sure. Um, and so the bouncing mine or the bounding mine is is meant clearly to kill. The um, blast mine is meant to maim. It's probably it may not kill you, although you could die of like your injuries later on, say, yeah. from like a, an infection or something like that. Um, or you could bleed out if it if it if it got enough of your femoral artery, you would be in big trouble there. But it's it's designed mainly just to maim you, take you out of commission. Whereas a, a bounding mine is meant to 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 blow you up and kill you. Then there's a fragmentation mine. That's the third type of anti-personnel mine. And and I don't, I mean, like, uh, for those of you out here, you can't see me and Chuck, but our fingers are kind of like digging into the tabletop right <laughs> now. It's all unnerving. This is just so grim and gruesome, you know? It's not, it's not, we're not even talking about shooting somebody. It's talking about these things designed to blow somebody up or blow their leg off, you know? Yeah, and I think what's most disconcerting about, like, like a, a minefield of blast mines is the the purpose to lay a minefield of blast mines is to almost certainly reroute somebody or to keep somebody from going somewhere. So it's not like they're saying, we're going to put down 300 mines here because we want to blow off 300 feet of soldiers. Uh, they just have to scatter them so a couple of people get their feet blown off and they go, holy cow, we're in a minefield. we got to go a different direction. Right. But the the residual effect is there's still 298 of those things out there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like a, a numbers game. So it's just – it's like the lowest common denom- denominator of of uh, strategy almost. Yeah. Yeah, but it's effective, which is why they keep using them. Yeah. And I think also like if the, the, arm, the army that was retreating, laying those mines in their wake, if they got 300 feet blown off, they'd be fine with that. Even though that, like you say, that's not the that's not the ultimate aim of it. It's to to redirect people or to stall them until reinforcements can come for you. Well, yeah, and you don't keep going. Like after it happens a couple of times, or maybe even once, mm-hmm. you don't think, well, man, well, let's just press on and see what happens. Right? Maybe that was a fluke. Maybe that was a geothermal spring. Right. <laughs> and um, you you talked about someone's foot being blown off. Supposedly, the nickname for the M14 blast mine, which we'll talk about in a second. Those are called toe poppers, Ugh. which kind of undersells it to me, I think. Yeah. So um, the last one, the last type of anti-personnel mine um, is a, f- a fragmentation mine. And that's meant to get a bunch of guys all at once all around you. And it may not um, it may not take off their leg. It may not kill anybody, but it's certainly going to slow down several um, several soldiers at once because these blow up and they shoot fragments everywhere. Yeah, and, like a, a pretty long way. Right. So uh, the Claymore mine is a, a, an example of a fragmentation grenade or a fragmentation um, mine. And then so too are cluster mines, which kind of fall into a different category because they're dropped out of bombs, typically dropped from aircraft. They fall out of cylinders, hundreds of them. And then when they hit the ground, they blow up and shoot hundreds of fragments. So each of those hundreds of small mines 
shoots out hundreds of fragments. The reason they become de facto landmines is because not all of them blow up. And so they can be found later and then blow up when they're being handled by a kid or a, a curious civilian or something. Play more with Claymore. Remember that from The Simpsons? No. <laughs> I think it was, boy, it was a long time ago, but I think that was like a poster in the um, shop of like a Army Navy store or something like that. The guy, the guy missing an arm. Oh, maybe so. Yeah, I remember. That was like one of the first season ones, I'll bet. It was old for sure. I forgot about him. Oh, and by the way, our buddy Kevin Pollack just guessed it on The Simpsons. After that many years, I would have thought he would have been on by now, but he did it like two or three voices this past week. I did not know that. I got to see that one. Yeah, it was good. How did he do? Did he crack under pressure? Yeah, <laughs> no, he did a great job. I'm sure he did. Uh, all right, so the M14 is... Um, these are small, like it fits in the palm of your hand. It's about an inch and a half, 1.6 inches tall and about 2.2 inches in diameter. And we developed this here in the U.S. in the 1950s, mm -hmm. and it has been sort of a go-to around the world since then. Uh, this one is not a very uh, big boom, um, but this it does cause damage with these little, these little silver BBs that it shoots out. That's the toe popper one. Yeah. So, oh, it does have BBs that it shoots out? I thought it was just a straight-up blast mine. Oh, I thought this one had BBs. Maybe I not. Don't, I don't know. Um, I, I know that this, uh, I, I don't know, possibly it could be modified. But it is small, and it, it looks like a mean little hockey puck, basically. Yeah, the meanest. The whole, the, and one of the things that you're going to find um, in mines throughout the world is something that's called a Belleville spring. Mm -hmm. And it's basically like a washer that you put on a... Uh, um, well, a bolt, <laughs> you know, what else are you going to put a washer on, you weirdo? <laughs> so it's a washer, but it's kind of popped upward on one side. So the, the Belleville spring holds up the firing pin, but when you put enough pressure on it and you overcome the pressure, the upward pressure being exerted by the Belleville spring, it kind of pops downward. And when it does that, it taps that firing pin, which shoots down into the, the detonator. It's really cheap really easy to to use and really effective and it's it's found through in mines of all different types and varieties it's usually the thing holding everything in place and then that's what pressure overcomes is a Belleville spring and they're found in the M14 mines as well yeah it's sort of like uh <clears throat> like the hand grenade it's not a very sophisticated piece of gear mm -hmm. um it's very kind of rudimentary and on all of them there's some sort of safety clip just like a grenade you remove the clip and usually there's some sort of switch that either says, I mean, it doesn't say this, but basically it says either boom or no boom, and you switch it to boom and set it down and walk away. Yeah. Backwards, and, I assume. Uh, yeah, slowly. Um, and, yeah, you cover it up maybe with some leaves, a little bit of dirt, just enough so that it can't be seen, but not enough that you would dampen the blast at all or make it so that any of the pressure is dampened. And all it takes is like 20 pounds or 9 kilograms of pressure from, say, somebody stepping on it, and that sets off the, I think it's got something like, uh, how many grams of Tetra in there it? 31 grams in the M14. So, that's, again, that's not very much, but it's enough that you will, say, lose your foot, or if you're stepping directly on it, you may lose part of your leg, and not necessarily right then, but you may have to have it amputated later on, which makes it even nastier. I, mean, I understand the point of this. It's like there's one soldier who's not fighting anymore. Mm -hmm. He's over there so sapping the healthcare resources of the, the, the medic, medical corps. But, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a lifelong injury. That's a nasty thing to put down as a $3, um, a $3 weapon that's just left behind under the dirt. Yeah. By, the, by the hundreds, by the thousands, by the millions apparently every year. Yeah, I imagine that setting these is a little unnerving too. Like, I know that technically, even for these small ones, it takes uh, however many pounds of pressure. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's still probably a little bit unnerving when you flip that thing to on and for scoop sure. a little dirt on top of it. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to, like, throw a dirt chunk on it or anything like that. Yeah. Or or what about being the guy who drives the truck that has crates full of those things in the back? Yeah. You're just hoping that all of them have the safety in. Yeah. So that's the M14. That's the one that's probably the most common throughout the world, mostly because it's the cheapest. Like I said, it costs about three U.S. dollars to make one of those things. Although supposedly it costs about $1,000 to remove one. 
Man, not well, that's part of the problem, too. Yeah, for sure. So the M16 is another kind. This is uh, one of the bounding uh, f- or fragmentation mines that we were talking about that pop up from the ground. Uh, and that has three main components, the mine fuse, uh, propelling charge to lift it out, like you said, uh, and then this cast iron housing. And it is it is bigger. It's about almost eight inches tall and about five inches in diameter. And it has about a little over uh, one pound of TNT inside. Mm-hmm. So that's that's quite a bit of boom going on. Yes, and and again, when you when you either step on the thing and you overcome the upward pressure from the Belleville spring, or I think these things can also be booby trapped. So like uh, a a wire can be attached to a uh, the the firing pin. Either way, the firing pin shoots down, ignites that um, that percussion cap, which sends the thing upward. And then a second detonator that's been on a delay fuse explodes once it reaches about three feet or a meter into the air. Yeah, I think one of the the scariest parts of this one, too, is, at least in the movies, there's like that split second uh, where you're a soldier and you see that thing pop up in the air and you know what's coming. Right. Yeah, with a, with a regular old blast mine, it's like step, boom. You know, uh, you probably don't have much of a chance to register that you just stepped on something. No. Whereas, yeah, that fra- fragmentation mine, and and again, like the sound that it makes is just horrifically unnerving. Yeah, well, I, I should say at least from the movies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and movies are always right. Yeah. Um, speaking of movies, though, like in the Hurt Locker, I know, and I've seen in other movies, like, um, I think generally you step on it, and once that pressure is released, is when the boom happens. Mm-hmm. So I remember episodes of maybe Mash. And other like war movies I've seen, there have been like soldiers would step on one and hear the click Mm -hmm. and then be like, well, I've got to stand on this thing now until we figure it out. Right. I was under that impression too, but nowhere in my research did I find that to be the case. Oh, really? Yeah. For me, everything I saw was once you step on it and that pressure overcomes the Belleville spring, the firing pin is shot downward into the detonation cap. And then once that happens, or the detonator, I should say, once that happens, the whole thing explodes. There's not like a, once you lift up, then the pressure or the firing pin is dropped. My guess is that they did not completely create that out of whole cloth and out of the 350 types of landmines that some of them probably do that. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. I'm just saying I didn't run across any that had that. And I noticed that as well. So next up, we have the the tank mines that we were talking about. Um, with the arrival of tanks, basically, is when we started getting these anti-tank mines. And they're much, much larger, and they require at least like 300-plus pounds of pressure. So unless you're a, a big boy soldier, then you're not going to detonate them by stepping on them. It's still <laughs> probably, again, I don't think you would give that a try and say— I only weigh 275. Let me sure. see what happens. Yeah. But uh, those are built to uh, disable a tank. Sometimes they can have so much boom that it can it can kill people around it, but generally it's to blow the, the, the tracks off of the tank. Right. And, yeah, and so once the tank is disabled, that's a, a, a that's big a win. Uh, yeah, that's a big win. So, um, again, they started making those – from what I can understand, as far as World War I goes, they made those first, and then they made the, the anti-personnel ones to keep people from just going up and picking up the, the mines and removing them. Yeah, so like they'll surround <clears throat> an anti-tank mine with several uh, anti-personnel mines. Right. And you said it has a big boom to it. It's This thing is um, it has 22, almost 23 pounds, just over 10 kilograms of Composition B. Yeah. Which is TNT and RDX. Yeah, that's a lot of boom. It is a lot of boom. Um, and if you have ever seen anybody removing an uh, anti-tank mine, you get the impression that, yes, it would it would tear a tank up pretty pretty well. Yeah. And w- you want to take another break and then come back and talk about removing some of these things? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay, Chuck, so we talked about what's out there and how many are out there. There are people who are dedicated to 
removing these things. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, a, a group uh, formed the uh, uh, an international uh, landmine treaty, ban treaty, um, to basically outlaw those things. And there's 164 countries that have signed it. Most of those, I think 163, have ratified it. And it basically says that we are not going to produce, stockpile, or transfer any mines any longer, landmines of any kind any longer. And we're also going to work toward removing old mines and getting rid of them, and then financially and medically assisting the uh, survivors or victims of landmines, casualties of landmines, uh, specifically, I think, civilians who have undergone uh, who've been blown up by a landmine. And they, they, I think they formed in like 1995, and within two years they won the Nobel Prize. Yeah, this is an interesting one because the U.S. and Cuba are one of the only two Western countries that have not signed on to this. Mm-hmm. Um, however, the U.S. is also probably the leading country in the world at pouring money into landmine eradication and support. Uh, and for their money, they say, listen— the, I mean, this is what they say, at least. They say the only reason that we're not signing on to this is because of the demilitarized zone between North Korea and South Korea. We need that line of defense so North Korea cannot march in there and attack our ally in South Korea. Um, I don't know whether to believe that. I know the Obama administration came close to signing on, but he never did. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's virtually guaranteed that the Trump administration won't sign on. Uh, There's like a 0% chance of that happening. But the more and more uh, nuclear-capable North Korea gets, the less and less uh, reason that you're going to have to have those landmines um, scattered throughout the DMZ there. Right. So I don't know whether to buy that or not, but they say that that's the reason. And to their credit, they do spend more money and time and efforts trying to clear the world of landmines than any other country, I think. Yeah. Yeah, they're definitely a leader in— Reality, but they're still criticized. Or the U.S. is still criticized by for not having signed on to this treaty. Sure, because rightfully. there's a lot of other states that may actually follow suit if the United States did. Yeah, they're in the company of um, Iran, uh, Israel, um, Azerbaijan, a lot of Russia. Um, for, yeah, Russia, a lot of former Soviet satellite states, um, China, some. Pretty big players in uh, in as far as global militaries go, right? Or militaries around the world go. Yeah. So if the United States did that, it would exert some pressure on some of the other ones. But like you said, the Trump administration is not huge on international treaties. And um, this, I think it was the New York Times editorial board that said there's a zero percent chance of us signing it, right? Yeah. But. W- we are still one of the leaders in actually removing mines. The United States military's stockpile is pretty small. I think it's around 3 million right now. And as far as I know, we're not deploying anymore. And we really haven't since, I think, 2003 uh, in Iraq, when we ev- invaded Iraq. That was the last time we laid landmines um, as far as the U.S. goes, right? Yeah, and 3 million sounds like a lot, and it is, but compared to like a Russia, which has like between 20 and 30 million, it's not as many. So one thing that, that like, I thought that was pretty odd, too. I was like, the the DMZ, that's what, that's why we're not signing on to this landmine treaty? That's weird. And then I started looking up cluster bombs. And there's another treaty, kind of like a corollary treaty to the International Landmine Treaty um, to ban cluster bombs as well. And that has some, it's much newer, but it has, uh, I think, a pretty decent amount, like 120 countries already signed on to it. But um, with cluster bombs, I was looking up the Pentagon's reasoning for not signing on to this treaty. Uh, so back in, I think, 2008, the Bush administration said the U.S. will sign this this cluster bomb ban treaty if we have not developed cluster bombs that have a failure rate of 1% or less, meaning only 1% out of every hundred of those little bomblets that comes out of the cluster bomb cylinder yeah. doesn't explode upon contact, right? Um, and apparently just within the last few days, the Pentagon said, well, the deadline's 2019. We haven't developed cluster bombs that have that low of a failure rate, so we're just going to ignore that and keep using cluster bombs. And the the, the report said it's because they want to reserve the right to use them in case of a ground war with North Korea. So I'm like, what do you guys know that we don't know? Yeah. 
Like, is there, is it is it really that eminent a ground war with Korea that we we need to reserve the right to use cluster bombs and in, in landmines still? That like, is it is it are we that close to the knife's edge? And if so, then this the whole the whole nuclear thing makes me even more nervous than it did before. Yeah, it should all make you nervous. It does. <laughs> so I'll tell you one thing that makes everybody nervous, Chuck, and that's being out in a minefield removing landmines. Yeah, so this is uh, th- this has many, many um, problems to root out. First of all, finding the mines, like you said earlier, they're not marked. They don't say, here's a minefield and here's where they're all located. Uh, so finding these things, millions of them around the world, is really tough. Um, and even in, when you find the minefield, it, it's tough. So, like, the first thing is to find the minefield, mm-hmm. then it's... It depends on how you do it, and we're going to talk about all the ways that they're trying to do this, um, some of which are very rudimentary, which uh, the very first one you can do is called probing the ground. That means walking around with a stick mm-hmm. or a bayonet and poking around. Lightly. Very lightly. Oh, so lightly. Yeah, I get the feeling that this is – I'm sure it's still done in some parts of the world, but it's certainly not one of the more advanced operations any longer. Uh, I get the impression that that's what soldiers do when they're like, nope, we can't go around. We have to keep going straight. Probably so. That that's what, because they use sticks or bayonets typically, and they're trained to kind of do it very, very lightly. Um, So I think that's who does that. All right. So you've also got trained dogs. Uh, This is horrifying when you think about a dog getting blown up. Um, But they are trained to sniff out these explosive vapors uh, and the bomb ingredients. Uh, I, I also saw rats have been trained by a company called Apopo. Oh, yeah, rats and bees. Mm, oh, I didn't see bees. That makes sense, though. Yeah, bees are trained, and uh, that was one of the things you sent over to me. The bees were? How did I miss that? I don't know, because you're huh. all about bees. Yeah, I love bees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the bees apparently um, it said the hard part is not training them to find these things, but tracking them once you release the honeybees. <laughs> that makes sense. So they're trained with sugar-coated TNT, uh, and then, of course, they can find the, the – that's how they find the TNT, but it has no sugar on it. Right. Um, one of the – I guess – I think – so that to me is a big step up from poking with a stick. Yes. In between those two is using a good old-fashioned um, metal detector. Yeah. It, it works, but the problem is twofold. One um, – Metal detectors send a signal back for anything that has any metal to it whatsoever. Uh So you get a hit and you are very like gingerly searching the area to see if there is a mine there. Nope, it's a it's an old Roman coin or it's like an old um, butterfly top to a a Miller beer can. (laughs) Um, It's anything metal. Right. So that's one part of the problem. And then the second part of the problem is that you um, you actually may miss metal because some types of the 350 different varieties of of mines use very little metal. Some of them are almost entirely plastic. Yeah. So you, so not only are you picking up stuff that's not a landmine and then wasting time seeing if it is a landmine, you're actually potentially missing landmines as well. Yeah, so that's that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Because that was my first thought is like I remember when I was a kid, my dad was all over that metal detector on the beach. Oh yeah. So just get a lot of my dads out there or dudes like my dad and just tell them to go wild. Yeah, they can coordinate over CB while they're driving their Jeeps out to the minefield. <laughs> they totally would. Uh, some more promising newer technology, um, specifically being developed at Ohio State University, and I think they're actually using this now, is called mm-hmm. uh, GPR, or Ground Penetrating Radar. Mm-hmm. Um, this uses magic leprechauns mm-hmm. <laughs> inside a machine. Who exert no pressure. To tell you uh, where these things are underground. Yeah, it's actually, it's pretty sweet. It's like a, a metal detector, ground penetrating penetrating radar combo. So the ground penetrating radar can show you if it's an anomaly, uh-huh. but then the radar also interacts with explosives and the uh, the electrical properties unique to explosives. So it can actually tell you there's something weird down there and uh, the amazing Kreskin here thinks that it's TNT. Yeah, and this is crazy. Once they find these landmines with the GPR device, it shoots chemical agents, two of them, into the ground that actually solidifies the triggering mechanism at first along with the soil. 
and then a second chemical agent that solidifies all of the mine in the soil so they can just be scooped up. Right. Well, I don't understand that. What is it? It I don't know. uh, I don't know. Is it cement? I I don't know if it was proprietary or what, but I couldn't find what those chemical agents were, but they sound pretty awesome. Yeah. And not something you want to, like, get on your hands. No. You know? No. Wash uh, hands, flush eyes. So that's actually, that's, that's like you said, that's in use. That's a huge innovation because it, it shows you, um, you get like the hits that you get from a metal detector, but you also don't get the misses. And then it also shows you if something is roughly the size or shape of a landmine. So you don't waste time digging up old, old butterfly bottle caps, right? Yeah. I like it. That's my favorite. And it came from the Ohio State University. This article gets it wrong. It calls it scientists at Ohio State University. Mm, the shame. Yeah. Uh, my favorite are these uh, these big heavy machines. So if you – and I didn't ever think I was a kid who liked uh, – I never played with like Tonka trucks and stuff much. Mm-hmm. I was obviously – you know, we talked about the evil Knievel and stuff like that and model, sure. model cars. Yeah. But uh, – for some reason, as an adult, heavy machinery really, really turns my crank. <laughs> so go look up in on your Google images uh, the Panther and the Aardvark mm-hmm. um, tank or mine removal machines, and just delight in these huge things that are part uh, Bobcat, part Humvee, uh, and they're they're just so rudimentary. Like literally, one of them. The aardvark has these – it has like a, a spinning uh, thing that sits out in front of it that just spins chains and like whips the ground with big metal chains. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's so brain dead and rudimentary that said, let's just get a big heavy thing out there that smashes the ground with chains. And the point is to just set off a landmine oh, yeah. encounters, right? So it's like – and the aardvark just takes it. It, 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 it huge anti tank mines just blowing up right underneath the these chains that are whipping up the ground. The front part of the aardvark, and I saw a video of a guy um, in one <laughs> who I guess hit a, a mine, and they show him in the cab, and he barely is jostled by the explosion. This huge explosion Man. that they show like eighty times because it's I think on the military channel or something like that, and. Um, it's like, why don't you just make everything out of whatever you're making the aardvark out of? <laughs> why isn't the tank made of that? It's, it's that same joke. It's like, you know, why don't you make the whole plane out of the black box if right. the black box <laughs> is the one thing that's always found? But it's true. And I'm sure, I, I think um, with MRAPs, like mine, I can't remember the, what that stands for, but you remember the IEDs that were killing so many American soldiers mm-hmm. at the beginning of the Iraq War. Um, and then they figured out a way to uh, armor plate Humvees so that they, they were kind of impervious to IEDs. Yeah. I think it's basically the same technology on the aardvark. Yeah, so that one, like you said, has a dude in it. Uh, then there's the Panther, and that is a 60-ton uh, remote-controlled thing. So this has somebody on the side with a joystick operating this thing through a minefield. This has big metal rollers to set off these uh, set off the mines. And then there are regular tanks that you can sort of retrofit with a plow mm-hmm. that sort of plows along and gently pushes these mines out of the dirt uh, in the path. Then someone can come along and I don't I guess collect them in a in a <clears throat> pink basket. Yeah, no, there's <laughs> there's a uh, there's another machine called a berm processing assembly yeah. that just goes down through these these mounds of dirt that have mines in them and shakes the mines out of the dirt and sets them off to the side so they're exposed so they can be picked up and detonated. Uh, We mentioned bees and rats and dogs. Um, Very sadly, elephants can sniff out mines. Uh, They're they're pretty good at it. They don't use elephants uh, to do this because that just doesn't make much sense. But they have killed and injured a bunch of elephants. Yeah. Um, My favorite new machine that they're using, and this makes total sense, are drones. Mm -hmm. The mine uh, KFON drone, K-A-F-O-N. This is a drone basically that was developed by a guy named uh, Masood Hassani. And it's a drone that does the work of the human. It's a drone with metal detectors attached to it. So it just flies really low over the ground. 
mm-hmm. and detects these landmines with nobody walking on the ground or no machine on the ground. Right. Makes total sense. It really does. It's great. And then what does it do? Is it mark it on like GPS or something like that? Yeah, it marks it on a GPS uh, and then can even come back and place a detonator, drop a detonator on it basically, fly away and it explodes itself. That's pretty awesome. And they're only like five grand compared to um, robots and stuff like that can go from 80 to half a million bucks. Yeah, the aardvark looks extremely expensive. For sure. I imagine it's not cheap. So um, we talked about the uh, International Ban Treaty, um, the campaign to ban landmines that won the Nobel Prize in 1997. Um, Their work actually had a huge impact. Uh, In, I think, 1999, there was a peak of casualties worldwide from from landmines of 9,228. By 2013, they'd gotten that down to 3,450. And it really looked like the work of this group and like the international treaty that that it created and and all these countries signed was having a real genuine impact on landmine casualties. Apparently, the tide turned in 2016 and the numbers have started to go back up. So the low was 3,450 in 2013. In 2016, it was up to um, 8,605, which has got to be really demoralizing. Yeah, and and I think you said very early on a lot of this is because of uh, what's going on at Yemen and Syria right now, right? Right. So sad. I, I saw also, remember I said Egypt has a lot of old mines from World War II. Apparently ISIS has taken to digging those up and, and replanting them. And we should say, you know, landmines and IEDs are virtually one and the same. It's just landmines are mass-produced, whereas IEDs are made by insurgent bomb makers. They're usually not commercially produced. Right. There's no contract that ISIS has out with somebody. Did you ever see Hurt Locker, The Hurt Locker? No, I haven't seen that one. Man, that's a good movie. Talk about tents. I can imagine. I mean, that's what they do, right? They go and, and remove mines, right? Or bombs or yeah, IEDs. Yeah, any IEDs, bombs, anything like any unexploded <laughs> thing. Uh, Jeremy Renner's in it. And these, uh, it's just amazing. Like, they just wear these, like, big heavy suits, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, like, anti-blast suits. And then work very carefully and slowly. Yeah. Uh, oh, one other thing, Chuck. Yes. Uh, Princess Diana. Yeah, we have to mention her. I mean, some of the, probably her most important work she did as princess was uh, in the the final years of her life working to try and raise awareness to eradicate landmines around the world. Mm -hmm. Just amazing stuff. And she wasn't, she took a lot of heat sometimes from within her own country. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes they didn't, they thought she was uh, just not being super helpful. Some people would... um, bag on her for uh, just doing, like, photo ops and stuff like that. But by all accounts, she was – I mean, she did what she could. She she had a lot of things that happened off the cameras. She would go and visit these hospitals where these children were affected, and it was a humanitarian effort to really kind of shine a light and raise awareness more than, like, hey, I can create policy right. as, as the princess. She knew she couldn't do that. Right. But she did a lot of great work to raise awareness, and when she uh, – when she died, it was a very sad day, and they, well, obviously for many reasons, but um, Nobel Prize winning uh, winner Jody Williams said the death of Princess Diana meant that the uh, anti-landmine activists lost their most visible advocate. So and that was very sad. She did great work. Yeah, I mean, it takes a certain kind of person to say, well, the global spotlight is on me right now. I'm going to walk over here to this um, under under underserved population of people who are being blown up by leftover landmines that yeah. people don't really know about, and now the spotlight's on them. Yeah. That says quite a bit about somebody to do that. Pretty amazing. You know? So, uh, you got anything else? I got nothing else. Uh, if you want to know more about landmines, you can type those words in the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com. And since I said landmine, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this brother and sister listening pair. <laughs> I was never a good headline writer on newspaper staff, by the way. <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> 
Uh, hey guys, finally feel like I have something to write about. My brother introduced me to your show over Christmas just this year, and I've been slowly working my way through. Uh, from D.B. Cooper to X Murders to Winchester Mystery House mm -hmm. to Jellyfish. I love them all. So first of all, thanks to my brother Michael, who lives in Savannah, for the introduction. He actually plays a role in why I'm writing. I just finished listening to the Vampire Panics episode. And at the beginning, you talked about coming upon dead bodies. Well, growing up, a dead body was discovered in the ravine behind our neighbor's house. And they had to pull it up the hill, so my brother and I got out our spy gear and took pictures of the policemen and paramedics pulling up the dead body and carrying it away. It's a lot of excitement, and at the time we didn't really think about it, but when the photos came back developed, it really finally hit home how creepy it was that we had seen a dead body. Yeah. Uh, anyway, thanks for providing inter uh, interesting and entertaining episodes. I teach kindergarten. Uh, it's funny, she talked about being drawn to the darker episodes as a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> uh, she says, sometimes you just need a break from boogers and Paw Patrol uh, and hear grown-ups talk about cool and interesting stuff. And that is from Melissa... And she's going to be at our D.C. show, and Michael in Savannah is upset because he can't go. Yeah, well, he should fly up to D.C. There are such things as airplanes. It's, it's greater chances of that happening than us going to Savannah for a show. And there are, or there is always room for boogers, Melissa. Don't be mistaken. There is room for boogers by Josh Clark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for writing in. Hey to you both. Um, and thanks for listening. And send us those pictures. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, you can send us an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. And as always, hang out with us at our home on the web, stuffyoushouldknow.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.